welcome to AT&T Threat Track for September 30th, 2014. This program provides security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today I'm joined by Matt Kaiser here in the studio, if we want to call it a studio, and John Hogaboom. I'm Brian Rexrode, and uh, let's go ahead and get to the obvious first here. We want to talk a little bit about shell shock, and maybe, John, you can give us a little bit of a background about what shell shock is. Okay, for the uninitiated, shell shock is a vulnerability in the Bash um, shell protocol or program that's in, on most Linux machines or Unix variants out there. Basically, the way this bug manifests is the parsing of environment variables and how that's being handled by the Bash program. So uh, someone had discovered a vulnerability, and that was, uh, and I want to kind of talk about that, about what's in scope of this vulnerability, because it seemed to kind of cascade over the past week in terms of, and a lot of people were confused what's in scope here. But So the first one is CVE 2014-6271, which is the original shell shock bash bug, they call it. What someone had discovered is if you send specially crafted headers to web servers that run bash in the back end, um, or call out to Bash as part of that, delivering that web page back to the user, the parameters, the headers that get passed through will get executed. Uh, so that's a pretty big problem. That's remote you know, code execution and uh, pretty easy to do for even a layperson to kind of script it together. I guess the subtlety here is that you know, when I think of Bash, this is the place where you log in and the whole function, the whole purpose is to be able to execute commands. Right. So there's something subtly different. It, it's, it's the fact that it's being passed through an environment variable. Yes, that right? right, that's correct. And the fact that you know, the code is being, it's code being passed in an environment variable and right. Bash is executing it when it really shouldn't be doing that in these right. cases. That was the first one. So they uh, released a patch for that. And uh, immediately some of the guys, some you know, savvy people discovered this didn't really fix all of the bug. It fixed mm -hmm. some aspects of it. So then CV 2014-7169 came out, which was to address some of the incompleteness of the original bug. And then uh, some other ones came out subsequent to that where they really haven't disclosed the details of it, but 7186 and 7187 are two others that really haven't been published up on the CVE vulnerability website with details, but they think it causes some kind of crashing to occur. And then as well, uh, one of the guys over at Google, Michael Zalewski, had two other bugs related to this, already in queue, I believe, and those are 6277 and 6278, basically similar type of thing, but also weren't covered by the initial patch. So, long story short, or although maybe it's not so short, <laughs> uh, Florian Weimer over at Red Hat took a look at this and said, well, this is really screwed up. We need to come up with a good fix for this patch. Right. And uh, he's released patch 27 for bash 43 dash patch 27. And that addresses all four of, you know, the original one, the 7169 follow-up one where it wasn't complete, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, the two Michael Zalewski bugs from Google uh, that he had discovered. Uh, doesn't address those other two undisclosed ones that we don't really know details of yet. Uh, uh, just so now the patch that from from Red Hat was actually it's going into the the new the bash GNU, right so bash, bash is by GNU GNU dot org um, and it's in that source code branch now you can go grab the patch and apply it you could build the source yourself if you want mm -hmm. uh, what all I guess what the other vendors out there are doing you know Red Hat and SUSE or whoever out there they're they're probably doing the same thing getting those patches applying them rebuilding RPMs or mm -hmm. uh, package files if they're Debian you know based things uh, for their own environments and distributing that to their the people right. and then I do have a on the slide here that we have an example of how you can test to see if you're vulnerable the easiest thing to do is make sure you've got the latest bash just do a bash dash dash version on it see that you're running 4.327 uh, although, I should say, even if you're not on 4.3, like you might be on some earlier release, like 3.4, and there are some other ones, they've released patches for those as well. Mm -hmm. So they did some back, back patches for older versions as well. So um, it's good to test to make sure you're not mm -hmm. vulnerable to it. Anyway, so that's the, the kind of setting the landscape of <laughs> what, the, you know, what the scope of the vulnerability is. 
And uh, I had a couple other things, and I know Matt's going to jump into some of these other things as well. But talking about the threat landscape and understanding what sorts of devices you should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. I know we've been looking at some of this stuff, and we see that there are devices that you normally might not expect, but it makes sense when you start to think about them. So webcam DVRs, VoIP phones, and mm -hmm. the uh, PBXs behind those, printers, network attached storage devices, all those kinds of things likely have some kind of web interface for them. Mm -hmm. And usually those web interfaces aren't really the most robust web interfaces. So mm -hmm. sometimes they got some bugs in there and they might call right. out the bash. Not saying all of them are like that, but those are good candidates. Um, and we've seen some devices like that that are vulnerable to this. So these are cases where something in the background, when you execute, when you click on something or whatever in the background, basically what it's doing is executing a bash shell and it's supposed to do a specific thing, but if you can inject in a field or something in the URL or in it's, a field. And typically we're talking about um, CGI scripts, mm -hmm. which right. are the ones that use bash on the back end for right. environment variables. Um, in particular, the headers that get passed from uh, a client to the server are stored as environment variables. And that's actually where we're seeing most of the exploitation on the web is that those headers are being populated with the, the shell shock mm -hmm. uh, attack scripts. Okay. And it could be something real simple where you've got a web page for some administrative interface and maybe in a part of the screen it wants to put the date or something or the current time. And for whatever reason that wants to shell out to bash to run date or something. And just that simple one little thing inside that page gets pat you know passes it through to bash all your mm -hmm. environment variables from your inherited you know environment and can cause that to occur where it can feed back and execute. Mm -hmm. So um, those are the types of situations where maybe you might see it in uh, those types of devices or you, know, you might have administrators who have written some, you know, cobbled together really quick scripts on web servers to do things that right. you know, they might not be savvy web developers and they did some things with Bash. Mm -hmm. So finding those things, you know, unlike Heartbleed, which we've talked about uh, in the past, Heartbleed was a little bit easy to find. So if you could find something listening on SSL, you could test it really quickly and say, yes, it's vulnerable, or no, it's not. Whereas this, you would have to crawl the entire web tree of that web server, Each URL. every single right. URL, to see is this one page vulnerable? Maybe one out of all 10,000 pages has some right. weird call out to bash where none of the other ones do. So that's the only way you could really assess it. So mm -hmm. you know, in my opinion, scanning is OK. It's, it's not gonna, it's gonna tell you when, yes, it definitely is vulnerable, but it's not gonna tell you just because it says, I didn't find it, that it's not vulnerable. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily traverse all the pages. It might right. be doing a handful of those pages or something. And, you know, certainly the cases where the root page demonstrates that it's vulnerable, that's, a, you know, it's a very low hanging fruit from an attacker's point of view. If they can just walk across an address and, and then find a page that's vulnerable, right? Right, right. Right. So, you know, I think the best thing in terms of a course of action for this type of uh, vulnerability is just have good asset inventory, know what machines you have and mm -hmm. what version of bash they're running and just patch batch. Whether or not they're running a web server or not, just get patch, uh, get bash patched on the machine mm -hmm. so that you, you, even if they are doing something and you haven't found that web page, that one web page out of the 10,000, you're covered or you yeah. should be covered from the I exposure. think that's one of the, you sort of point out one of the subtleties that's coming up is that most inventories are tracking, you know, what type of operating system it is or what version of the operating system is it. They're not really thinking about all of the little tools that are embedded within. And in fact, there are a lot of devices that are out there that uh, you don't even, it, they don't even outwardly convey the fact that they're running a Linux operating system underneath there. So uh, we really have to keep a close eye on the inventory of products that are, you know, posting patches associated with this. Or perhaps it requires some asking some questions to find out if that, you know, if that device or the vendor has patches that are coming due. Right, right. So, all right, good. So, uh, Matt, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the shenanigans. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of shenanigans going on. I mean, there's, there's plenty of posts online if you want to look for these. The ISC right. has a pretty good list. Um, but basically what's been offered to most people on the Internet at this point is the ability to run practically any shell command you want on a vulnerable mm -hmm. server. So you've got all sorts of motivations for doing this. Of course, you've got people who are curious and they want to run one of the many available Shellshock test tools against their favorite website to see if it's vulnerable mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And you know, people are going to do that because they're curious. You've got more advanced security researchers who want to you know, 
push a very, very minimal payload, something like a, you know, tell it to ping me back when it's been confirmed vulnerable, mm -hmm. and then they'll take, take a list and say, okay, at some point in the future, they'll make a list and say, here's all the sites we found, you know, this part of the internet's more vulnerable than this one, blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's you know, statistics gathering, and maybe mm -hmm. for a little bit of a brag rights to say, I scanned the whole internet and found all the machines. That seems to be a trend that kind of started with Heartbleed, it, mm -hmm. it, it seems, that, you know, all of a sudden, it's okay to scan the internet to find vulnerable machines. It's my impression that that's not really a good idea. It certainly creates a lot of noise in terms of trying to understand where the real malicious actors are. For, for people who want to you know, self-promote a little bit and show off what they can do in terms of scanning, mm -hmm. I, I see why they're doing it, but from a defender standpoint, it makes it difficult to determine you know, I've seen, you know, this is my, my show shock alarms going off the, you know, off the charts. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's some guy who's doing nothing but pinging back to himself to say, okay, this server is vulnerable and he's not going to do anything about it. Yeah, exactly. The uh, intrusion detection system vendors have provided signatures. There are some signatures available. We've deployed some. And the, uh, the, the you know, they just light up. So sure. how do you decide which ones to deal with? And how do you know which ones are, you know, saving this for that self-promotion or, or that, that glory part, which of them are mm -hmm. sorely tucking it away somewhere to be used in the future. You know, it's hard to tell. And at some point, Absolutely. you have to treat most of it as malicious anyway. You have to say, look, if you're going to be sending these characters and, and your headers you know, to my machine, I'm going to treat you as an adversary. Yeah. It, it, it makes it difficult. For patching here. No. <laughs> well, but there are also some, some actual adversaries out there. And in yeah, fact, there's absolutely. a pretty good amount as well. Um, I've seen, looking at a bunch of different samples, mm -hmm. it's a wide variety. I mean, some of it looks like it's old IRC bot code that's been recycled since 2002. Like some of them actually still have vulnerabilities from 2002 that are lying unused in the sort code. Sort of the beginner, beginner botnet stuff. Oh, <laughs> I, I think there was up. even one server that was like irc.beginninghacking.something <laughs> was the name of the server that it called back to. Right, so these, right. are, these are the script kiddies. These are the guys who have been handed something by a friend and they want to just test it out. Well, and actually this doesn't surprise me all that much. That is, on the one hand, there are the, those that are, you know, kind of focus on exploitation. Mm -hmm. And it puts them potentially in the category of script kitty relative to central command and control, botnet command and control. So mm -hmm. if they wanted to build a botnet, you know, the tendency is to have people that have expertise in one or the other. And it takes a little time for the two to join together. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think we're going to start to see, I think there was at least one where it looked like it was starting with the botnet and then adding in some pieces mm -hmm. for the exploit portion of it and so it's not surprising that we see it's some not always amateurish type gluing the pieces together in the they, they are gluing the pieces together in some cases we've seen other things as well the meanest that i've seen is someone just throwing in a few more extra bash characters to make it a fork bomb mm. so there's you're going across the internet and, and hosing machines as they go which is explain fork bomb to me a fork bomb <laughs> is a very small piece of code that just creates new processes constantly and mm -hmm. that those processes create more and those processes create more, and eventually the resources of the system get tied up, and it crashes. So you have to allocate some time, some space and memory for each one of those processes. Eventually, it fills up the uh, the RAM memory, and then you start using your swap space. And then when that's the gone, yeah, thrashing around, and you end up with the machine just kind of going into right. right. So that's that's pretty unkind. There um. are <laughs> mitigations around that, but most people never do this. Uh, there, I forget the name of the file, but in Linux. There's a file that allows you to set the maximum number of processes that a you know a mm -hmm. user ID can create, uh, but by default it's unlimited for everybody. Well, uh, but there are you know mitigations around that if you were to enable it. But right. like I said, most and people don't. a good don't. thing to do, certainly for an internet-facing right. application, right? So we have seen actual malware. Um, these are all ELF binaries, which are the the uh, the Linux Unix ones. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit less common because we're typically we deal with the, the Windows side of malware much more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, seeing as this is a bash vulnerability, that's what you're going to get. Um, there was one that was a DDoS bot that made a, a big splash in the news called WAPBot, and that one was an ELF binary, and it actually used, I believe, it was just a very simple Telnet-like protocol for command and control, calling back to of all ports, port five on its command and control server. I think that the, the one that was reported has since been taken down. Mm. Um, they're probably trying to rebuild that as well. And so far, uh, I've only seen one of these, but someone wrote like a very quick one-liner to search for Bitcoin wallets on the machine, mm -hmm. grab the, um, the balance, and then post that balance to a Bitcoin address somewhere. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What I haven't seen too much of is worm-like behavior. Right. It seems like there are single you know, attack points 
that are pushing you know, malware, but those infected machines don't seem to be trying to infect more machines, mm -hmm. which is kind of curious. But Well, I, I'd read about one that was at least trying to do that, and, and I only read about it. I hadn't seen an actual sample of it, but it wasn't particularly successful, and I think it is attributable to the fact that it was probably just scanning the root level of a website mm -hmm. and maybe not finding all that many sites that were vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess perhaps an, another question here, there isn't really any platform specific aspect to this. That is, if it has a bash shell, has a web interface, it doesn't matter whether it's Apache or, or what processor is underneath there, you're going to be able to execute things, right? It's whatever is on the machine. For the most part. And not only that, it doesn't have to be a web server. So we know, like we were talking about VoIP type mm -hmm. things um, through SIP are potentially exposed, as well as DHCP. So we know, like the DH client yeah. process on Linux, actually bash, you know, shells out the bash as part of its process. And if you get a rogue DHCP server sending back, you know, crafted headers back to the client, he can get the client to execute something that maybe you don't want him to. That's one that confused me at first because I was thinking in terms of the DHCP, DHCP server, but it's actually the client that becomes the victim in that yes, case. So you yeah. got to watch. He's and trying to get sure an IP address, and here's a rogue DHCP server maybe on the network that race condition beats him with a response mm -hmm. from the real DHCP server, and now he's you know potentially compromised because of that. All right. So that's so a real be, tricky one as well. Yeah, so that would be something you'd want to be careful about in terms of a local network mm -hmm. where you're operating a DHCP server, somebody might come out. If you have a rogue DHCP server, they might be able to, as you said, beat the, uh, the request to the, the regular server to the answer and uh, be able to proliferate something within an enterprise to, or a public Wi-Fi hotspot. I think that one's going to be interesting if, because if you've got your malicious DHCP server on a segment that doesn't typically use DHCP and someone happens to plug in a laptop there, there's no race. The mm -hmm. malicious one's going to win because no, mm -hmm. no one else will respond. All right. Good yeah. point. Good point. Okay. So uh, I guess, you know, this I think kind of sets a precedent that, uh, you know, we had the heart bleed incident. We have this, uh, this shell shock. And I thought it'd be worth talking a little bit about, you know, I would expect that we're going to see more cases like this. We see more and more platforms, more devices that are using basically the same code base. And actually, I think the first example that we had of this was several years ago. Matt, you may not have been born yet. Right. But I know John remembers it. It was the, the SNMP vulnerability where they had a parsing error in the ASN parsing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that was, I think, the first case where we had run into a, a situation where lots and lots of platforms with, that had been based on a, a, effectively the same code base and required a lot of patching. You, I'm being facetious, obviously. This is only a few years ago. <laughs> but the, uh, so the situation here is I think we're going to see more cases like this where we find a flaw in the code base and a wide variety of systems need to be patched. And how do you manage that process? So I thought it would be worthwhile to talk about that a little bit. And, um, you know, the, uh, the first aspect of this is that I guess if you're going to try to uh, deal with this, I'm kind of assuming a large organization, although perhaps smaller organizations really should be thinking about this type of thing. But the first thing is, you know, as we were talking about here, just understand what the vulnerability is. You know, what kinds of things do you really need to be concerned about? We talked about in the shell shock here. It's not just the 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 vulnerability itself, but how does it get exposed externally? Right. And, you know, do you have internet facing systems that might have this uh, vulnerability or what aspects do you would be talked about the DHCP? That's a little bit of a stranger situation where are there circumstances where you need to be concerned about those types of things. So it's, I think it's important to get a good handle in your head about how this thing might be exposed and how you'd use that to help manage your priorities in terms of patching. Because if you have lots of systems that need to be patched and perhaps you don't have an automated way of doing that, it's going to be important to be able to set your priorities. Of course, I guess automating patching processes is an important part of this too, right? Right. You know, in, just in the understanding the vulnerability, even with the open, SS, open SSL Heartbleed, initially everyone was like, oh, you're running HTTPS, that's the vulnerability and, you know, end of story. Where well, that really wasn't the case. Once we started exactly. to dig in deeper, we realized there's all kinds of other things like 
encrypted email with your Pop S, you know, connections, mm -hmm. and um, I'm trying to think of some of the other uh, VPN connections, uh, VPN connections yeah. uh, Tor nodes, which also were HTTPS or variations, TLS type things happening. Mm -hmm. So it's not always the easiest to assess it yourself. Sometimes you need to kind of crowdsource it with the community and understand. You know, all the different aspects. Same thing with this. Initially, we were kind of like, oh, yeah, if you have an HTTP server, web server that's shelling out the bash, that's your, your exposure. That was on Wednesday. I think we were kind of all on the same page. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, we were like, oh, what about some other things that might call out the bash, like mm -hmm. VoIP, like the DHCP stuff? There's probably right. even yet other things that we haven't even thought of yet that might still call out that this could potentially be used again. So an aspect of this, I think you're pointing out, is to get, get an ear down to the community or some eyes onto the community and try to find out what other people are talking about because the initial vulnerability report not, doesn't necessarily tell you the whole story. Right. In fact, right. it, in this case, it was the tip of the iceberg. They listed a few different types of Linux, and then the next thing you know, it's a whole pile of products that you know, have uh, Linux underneath. And so you also want to start thinking about, well, if I don't have patches ready, how do I protect myself in the meantime? What you know? What is the level of exposure, and how are you going to try to do uh, do protections? We uh, you look at things like can you do something with a firewall or with web application firewall or with right. intrusion detection signatures to try to get a better assessment of what's going on, be able to uh, put some protection measures in place. I think the next thing here is you want to try to uh, establish some level of coordination. Again, with a large organization, you might have to reach out to organizations that. And I'm kind of uh, making an assumption here, maybe you're a security representative in a corporation or something like that. Start reaching out to other organizations that you might not expect you had to reach out to before. So in a case like this, uh, you know, printers might be involved and network devices might be involved. So what, you know, who are the people that are responsible for those things? It's not just patching your servers in the rack anymore, right? Right. Um, I, I guess in the case, uh, and uh, you know, I thought of the HVAC type, <laughs> you know, control devices that uh, because that was uh, not necessarily a vulnerability associated with the uh, attack on target, but I think it was one of the avenues that went in that was used to a control function and there. It's definitely a possibility with the shell shock, right? Um, so for sure, that's one that you'd want to think about. Well, and I think it helps to have coordination in terms of a sort of a central point where you can collect questions and the answers to those questions and have sort of a consistent approach to answering them or a, and a manage a policy for the organization. And I also think it's important to don't assume that, let's say you discover that you have some appliance from a vendor. Maybe it's not a big vendor for something like an HVAC or something that is in your environment. Don't assume that the vendor knows that they're vulnerable. Absolutely. You might need to engage that vendor and let them know that you discovered this. They might not have massive deployments of this, of whatever you're mm -hmm. using, and you might need to you know, engage your vendors to make sure that they're aware and that they're going to provide patches for you. Yeah, that's a good point. But and if you're a vendor, please be aware of what, uh, <laughs> what's going into your product. Yeah, well, you know, th this has been a little bit of my pet peeve about this Internet of Insecure things, that, sure. and, and this is not all things that connect to the internet by any stretch of the imagination. The ones that I'm referring to are, just as you pointed out, Matt, some of these devices really don't have good patch processes, and they might come out with an update, but it's based on complaints from the users. So as John was pointing out, you have to complain, in a sense, in order to uh, instigate it. And I don't think it's going to be one person complaining that's going to get them to, to make a change. It's going to be a, a number of folks are going to need to do that to really inspire the changes. It's the same philosophy I have when the power goes out at home. I'm always the first one to call, let them know, hey, the power's out, <laughs> so that they know, okay, in or that area, they're going to try to get yep, my power absolutely. restored. Yep. If nobody calls, they might not know, although nowadays the power system is yep. pretty good. They, they have sensors everywhere, but in the old days, that wasn't yeah, always the case. Yeah, that's absolutely true, but it's that, it's that whole notion of crowdsourcing, very effective way to get things done when it's uh, that reporting complaints is a, is a factor of that. Uh, you know, the next thing here is, um, is testing. And I think uh, sometimes testing gets kind of, uh, I think, mischaracterized. The intent of testing, in my opinion, is to verify things. Sometimes, you know, vulnerability scanning or testing might be used as a means to try to identify vulnerable devices. But that's only as good as the inventory of the things that you're scanning. 
There can be things that are hidden behind NAT or, you know, sitting out on the internet that you didn't know about and those sorts of things. So I think testing, I look at testing as a means to basically verify or help to assess your completeness of the patching processes and the processes that you're using to manage those patching activities. But an important case, and I think this is a, a, a good example, you need to make sure that your vulnerability testing tools have been updated to reflect the signatures of the things that you're trying to test for and have done a relatively comprehensive job at doing that. It's, I think you were referring to earlier, John, you know, some voice over IP devices can have this vulnerability, but the scan tools might only be yeah, looking for web pages. The web stuff, right. So uh, it's important to, to uh, work with your vendors in that context as well to make sure that they have uh, updates for the, uh, the tools and that they're testing them effectively. So again, I want to emphasize that I see that as a backup activity to help verify the progress and make sure that the patches are being done pro properly and that, the, uh, that there's good coverage. And then, uh, then we talk a little bit about remediation activities. You want to make sure that you're uh, tracking the state of vendor patches. Not all vendors have provided patches for these tools yet, and even some major vendors are still have uh, are still working on and either even assessing the vulnerabilities of their devices. Again. I think uh, we sort of touched on this. Watch the forums, see what's happening in terms of the updates, and also to see if there are indications that the patches might be causing troubles. You right. know, we went through several. Or that they're not complete, which was the case early on with this one. Right. Yeah, they've. Uh, they didn't they're address more the whole problem. Nuances were discovered along the way. I think there was actually one where there was uh, at least a uh, indication that it broke some features in Bash and uh, needed to make some uh, perhaps repairs or might have some impact on applications that are using this undocumented feature. Right. right. This is an undocumented feature. Yeah. Right? Oh, that would be, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then again, verifying with scans and tests along the way. And then, uh, John, I think you already pointed this one out, is that uh, you want to set up a communications path with your vendors, make sure that they understand that you're expecting patches from them and that you would like them quickly. And uh, I think you already sort of pointed that out for us, and uh, good job at doing that. And then last but not least, I see, you know, Matt, you, you went through a list of items here. Threat analysis, I think, is an important part. That is, consider how the threats that are using this, you know, if exploits are being put together, how robust those exploits are, are there botnets being developed, having an understanding of what types of things the malicious actors might be going after may help you to prioritize your patching processes. Obviously, you want the high value assets to be protected first. Uh, certainly anything you have with a, a Bitcoin wallet on it is gonna need to get some a little bit of priority, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the case of the shell shock. So, I don't know, any other thoughts that, uh, did we miss anything here? No, I think you got it covered. All right, so uh, I think um, that's, uh, anyway, that's a, in a nutshell, uh, what, we think is uh, worthy of taking a look at in a case like this. I expect that we're going to see ca more cases like this in the future. And so uh, getting a system together, plan ahead a little bit, be prepared, get your contacts in place, and uh, then cases like this aren't going to be uh, much of a catastrophe Set up at all. A good it's more, communications channels more of a routine. That you can all work together you know, in your organization and quickly come together and, and work an issue like yep, this. Absolutely. You know, the rest of the world hasn't stopped here. It's not just shell shock. So, John, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the other activities that are going on. Right. Small, it's relatively, compared to shell shock, not as newsworthy of a story, but I thought it was an interesting one because I don't think we've discussed this before. But the FBI uh, released a, um, uh, a bulletin to healthcare providers. It was about a large breach at the Community Health Systems Incorporated information on four and a half million patients was stolen by hackers from that organization. So the FBI said, hey, watch out for this, because what they've been actually seeing is that these stolen medical records, not specifically from this one, but from other breaches as well, are being used in medical fraud. So the types of things that they're doing with the medical fraud is they might purchase medical equipment uh, and drugs and then resell them mm -hmm. uh, somewhere. I'm not quite sure how the bad guys resell that stuff, but they, you know, they do that with your fraudulent or the stolen identity information that they have. Uh, they also will file false claims with insurers so that they can just get money right from the insurer. Right. The important thing about this is that unlike bank fraud, 
the banking systems and credit cards, they are really on top of fraud activity. They've been, doing, it for, They've for been doing that for a while. As soon as there's fraud detected, they're really quick to respond. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the medical uh, field, not so much. So healthcare mm -hmm. insurance providers, they're using relatively antiquated systems still, and they probably aren't as quick or as savvy in detecting fraudulent activity occurring. So it might go on for months or even years before they pick up the fact that it's actually happening. Yeah, I guess to, to provide a little bit of counterpoint, because I have had a little bit of interaction with the insurance industry and what they do, the type of fraud that they tend to be looking for is sort of the repetitive cases where, you know, a claimant is making numerous claims. Right. They're not looking for this case where fraudulent claims may be scattered across a number of of, of insurees is yeah. that the proper term? So it's a different type of analysis that needs to take place in order to find the fraud. But you know, ideally, you want to prevent the fraud in the first place, right? Right, right. <laughs> so, um, so it's an interesting one. What you can do as a user, uh, as you know, someone that's insured, I'm not quite sure. But it's more, I guess, something to the insurance companies, in my opinion, to you know. Well, I think it's uh, we're going to need to take a little closer look at the claims that are being made against our our insurance policies. That right. is, uh, you know, oftentimes those reports are available. If you're not taking a look at that and scrutinizing what's being done, you may get claims against your policy that you didn't really know about. Ultimately, that's going to start reflecting on other things. It's going to look like medical activity on your record, and significant, if it's significant fraud, there that could have some other problems if you try to change insurance providers or something in the future. So right. those types of things, I think, are going to, there may be more of a strategic concern for the uh, for the victims in this case, thinking of the uh, end user victims. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of co comparisons to credit card fraud. Mm -hmm. um, in credit card fraud, someone, you know, use, they lose their, their credit card number, maybe their CVV as well, and then it's used to abuse and get money and other things like that. But then that information can be revoked. Mm -hmm. And that's cut off. You know that mm -hmm. that ends there. In the medical situation, you've got personal information, you know, social security numbers, medical history, things that can right. be used to verify it. That's your identity. It's much harder to revoke those kinds of credentials. So that will have much more. I think that has more value on just because it has that longevity. Yeah. That it's really hard to say I am no longer the me that is doing this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not like we have a. Some You're sort of identifying information. To change your name and right. Right. your number identity. Go into like a, uh, a insurance fraud protection program. Right. Of some it's not sort. as easily <laughs> revocable as a credit card is. Right. Absolutely right. true. You, just, you know, say this one's no good anymore. Give me a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to your point, medical identities on the black market are about ten dollars each, whereas a credit card is about a buck each. Right. So obviously, they're much more valued in terms of what you can do with them. So they're charging mm -hmm. more. Uh, on the black market for these identities because they know that they're going to be able to whoever's going to use it is going to get more out of it in the long mm -hmm. run. So, so are there things that as a as a subscriber to insurance policies that you can try to help to uh, encourage your insurance company to to provide you better protections? The only thing I can really think of is to make sure that there are good reporting functions that is, you know, regular reporting to say, you know, these claims have been made against your policies, that sort of thing, so that you'd have an opportunity to, to know what's going on. Yeah, I guess uh, I think you're right. Uh, I know with mine, I get an email mm -hmm. from my insurance provider that lets me know when a claim has been made against my account. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I don't really take it scrutinize it very closely, but maybe I, sh I will from, from now yeah. on. Well, and we're all learning from the process here. Right. This is all a, a new adventure for everybody. And I think on the, by the same token, you know, I've heard of stories where people go into the, you know, the doctor's office and you can see how they kind of manage information. And perhaps, you know, I think there are things as consumers that we can do to be watching how information is treated. You know, do they have... Uh, good passwords on their on their computers. Is it left logged in all the time? Subtle things like that can give you indicators of what kinds of things might be going on behind the scenes as well. To what extent are they really paying attention to protecting your information, and uh, perhaps gives some opportunity to provide some feedback. I think ultimately it's that crowdsourcing thing that is if enough of us express our concerns, then they're going to start paying attention. It's part of their business and important to it.
And hopefully your doctor's office is uh, whatever system they're using to manage their patient records and other information is not the same one that they're using to browse the internet while nobody, no patients are there. Yeah, um, because that would be a bad conflict of interest where I could see them easily getting infected. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely, a good point. I think it might be time for the two uh, industries to get together. The one, you know, the credit card financial, who has the experience in, mm -hmm. you know, validating people's identities properly and finding ways to quickly cut off the source of fraud mm -hmm. once it's started. If they were to get them in the room with the medical community, you might find some ways to, you know, it's maybe maybe it's every time I make a claim online, I need to use my, my two-factor authentication or some other means of, mm -hmm. you know, temporary authentication. The transaction process in, in itself would be mm -hmm. a, you know, a good opportunity for validating uh, the transactions are being done properly. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there are some companies that have a little bit of both. And so perhaps there is some opportunity, particularly with those organizations, to get together and, and do some things. We'll have to keep an eye on this and see how it develops. It turned out to be more of a story than you thought, John. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at the internet weather for the last week or so here. And, and uh, I guess the first on the list here is a, uh, a, some scam probes that are taking place on port 10,000 TCP. And this is relatively new activity. This is uh, actually network delivery management protocol. I think I got that right. NDMP is the uh, acronym, at least. I'm not exactly sure if I got the translation right. But uh, in the description here, and I actually, I just got this off of Wikipedia, I have to admit. The, uh, it says to transport data between network attack storage devices and backup devices. I'm not sure if that's the application that you found, John. No. <laughs> uh, actually, what we were able to do is with the honeypot identify more specifically what was going on behind this activity. And right. John, I'll so let you go. The activity on it. port 10,000 TCP that we've been seeing is probes for uh, the Webmin administrative panel, which mm -hmm. happens to be a CGI program. Uh, so it's very likely it's a shell shock. And we went to the Webmin website. Webmin, by the way, is uh, it's a web administration control panel for your web server or your server in general. Okay. So it's kind of like a web front end that allows you to administer aspects of your server. Mm -hmm. And uh, to that end, it probably has some elevated privileges to that since it can do certain things with your server. Uh, in any event, uh, the Webmin uh, web page does mention that there is a vulnerability that they have a fix for. So you should go uh, apply that fix. So this is likely actors who are seeking out you know, uh, si you know, systems that have Webmin installed that haven't updated yet. All right, and we're showing a quote right off the page here. It says, update should be installed immediately, capital letters, on any system that do not have a fix for the shell shock bug. So uh, there clearly is activity out there looking for the opportunity to uh, perhaps exploit those devices or at least enumerate ones that appear to be vulnerable. Taking a look at the top 10 most probed ports, we have some activities probably worth noting here, uh, and then a number of others that aren't really a surprise. First item is uh, port 53 UDP. That's consistently has been uh, exhibited indications that it's part of the uh, reflection denial surface attack activity, in this particular case, DNS amplification attacks, followed by port 443. We're going to take a little closer look at that one. That's uh, jumped up a number of steps, seven steps in the ranking since last week, 443 obviously being uh, SSL encrypted web access followed by port 22 TCP and port 23 TCP. That's worm activity associated with usually brute force password guessing attacks, oftentimes associated with Internet of Things type devices. Followed by port 80 TCP. That's actually gone down a little bit, but uh, there's probably probing activity again associated with the shell shock activity, followed by port 445 TCP, and then followed by uh, one that is relatively new in terms of scanning activity, 9064 TCP, and we're going to take a little closer look at that one in just a moment here, and followed by 8080 TCP and 1900 UDP, 1900 being the SSDP activity associated with uh, reflection attacks, and then 8080 most likely looking for uh, proxy activity. So let's take a closer look at port 443. There's been some regular probing activity on that port. The primary source of activity here is actually a US-based university doing security research, one that we know about. But there is a follow-up to that. The, uh, basically, about 30% of the activity is uh, associated with uh, probing from China. And I think that's more attributable to, you see, the density of activity increasing over the last several days, which corresponds fairly closely with the disclosure of the shell shock.
So there's a reasonable chance that there's scanning going across SSL encrypted websites, uh, perhaps looking for the uh, CGI scripting that might uh, provide access to the Shellshock uh, vulnerability. Next item here is that scan probes on port 9064 TCP. Most of these sources are in China. Uh, there are some in the United States as well. What I was able to find in the, some research here is some uh, attribution that is, there was some research done by Norse which suggested that they, this uh, probing was looking for open proxies. And uh, John, you had the chance to take a look at it from the honeypot point, point of view. I did. While I was in the honeypot for the other stuff, right. uh, I noticed <laughs> that this was in there as well. And it is searching for open proxies on port 9064. The way they're testing is they're actually looking for translate.google.com mm -hmm. slash something. I can't remember what they're looking for. It's just kind of a test thing to see if they get right. the answer they expect back, then they know that it's acting as an open proxy. Right. So we're seeing now obviously an increase in uh, the number of uh, probes associated with that. Obviously open proxies allow the opportunity to anonymize and then perform potentially other nefarious activities uh, without being as easily traceable. And I, I will mention that apparently there's quite a few number of open proxies on port 9064, which I really wasn't aware of. I know, you know, 3128 and 8080 and 8000, a lot of those ones we see a lot of these proxies on, but I, I wasn't aware of 9064 yeah. before, so. And apparently most others weren't aware of it before either because they just started scanning. Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> who's operating them or why on that port, but uh, it appears that there's a fair number of them. Yeah, so that's absolutely. why they're looking for them. Yep. Uh, next item here is the um, top 10 most sources doing the probing. Top on the list here is port 23. We're going to take a look at that one in a, in a couple of minutes here, but that's followed by 445 TCP, and uh, we have some other ports that probably aren't significantly worth mentioning, although it's interesting that the uh, 16470 UDP showed up back on the list, and uh, we're going to have to take a look at the uh, state of zero access and see how that's... Yeah, I haven't looked at uh, been going along lately. And then followed by port 5000 UDP, and we're going to take a look at that one as well. So let's take a look at port 23 TCP. You know, I was mentioning to the guys earlier when I looked at this, it, for some reason it made me want to uh, take a, you know, go surfing or something. You see all the waves here. Maybe it's just uh, the, the end of summer. But in any case, uh, this is actually showing 90 days of activity. I think the, the slide actually shows, it says 30 days, but it's actually looking at 90 days of activity to give you a little better perspective. Clearly what this is indicating, or perhaps not so clearly, but the fact that we're seeing a lot of up and down activity and perhaps some dips and, and ups and downs, we're looking at the number of source addresses that are doing probing activity on this port. And that's a very strong indication that when they are moving up and down together like this, that it's under effectively a common command control. So there may be multiple botnets, but most of this activity is actually associated with a single botnet. And uh, we're looking at, uh, at peak here, well actually the more recent activity on around 30,000 sources that are doing this probing activity. And this is the classic internet of insecure things that we've been talking about. Uh, where uh, brute force password guessing attacks is able to uh, to to uh, gain these devices. I'm kind of curious if maybe some of the recent activity was something inspired devices to be rebooted or something, and it maybe uh, wiped out some of the uh, malicious code behind it, opened up those devices to the vulnerability again, and they're going back and trying to rebuild this botnet to mm. a, its former state. Were there any major power outages in the last uh, few days? <laughs> That's a good question. Or perhaps somebody was trying to do some mitigating efforts, and uh, but perhaps didn't realize that it wasn't a true mitigation. It's just really a you know a little bit of a deterrence. That's one of the challenges that we have with this type of activity is that you know you can reset the device, but unless you actually have a patch and go through the arduous process of patching, it's uh, it's not going to really fix the problem. Uh, next item here is uh, scan sources on port 5000 UDP. And this is a case where most of the sources US-based consumer, or actually you know, associated with addresses that are in consumer ISPs. So it appears to be there's a possibility that this is associated with devices that are being exploited. It's not very clear if that's the case, but there certainly is some uh, activity worthy of some uh, further investigation. Open source research, I was not able to find anything that suggests what this activity is, even though it's been going on for the last week or so. Reported this last week and uh, really it uh, still needs a little bit more research. Yeah, and when we looked last week, I didn't look this week, but last week it was a lot of home routers seemed to be yeah, the source of the activity. Right. 
So uh, that's our show for today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. I'd really like to hear your feedback on the, uh, uh, you know, managing large vulnerabilities and uh, perhaps some of your experiences. And uh, if you have some things that perhaps we missed and uh, might be helpful, uh, we'd love to hear from you about that. Uh, you can find Threat Track on the AT&T Tech Channel. It's att.com slash threat track. It's also available on YouTube, iTunes, and you can uh, follow us on Twitter if you like. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Matt, Matt Kaiser, John Hogeboom. I'm Brian Rexrode. We'll be back next week with another episode. And until then, keep your network safe.